All right, everybody, I wanna say first and foremost, special thanks to uh, the people at ELF University for putting on this fantastic event. Um, we were at Santa's castle last year, but you all know it happened last year because that uh, happened. But this year, this year, it's, it, we're finally going to have a year where Christmas happens without a hiccup. I, I think I can feel it deep down in my You have a piece of spaghetti. Walking with Santa, uh, the other instructors at the Sands Institute, we think that we've had such a long run of really harrowing Christmases that it's finally time for a Christmas where absolutely nothing of any interest happens whatsoever. And we'll have to see if that actually happens this year. So here's hoping. Um, so I got this presentation, A Hunting We Must Go, that I wanted to share with everybody uh, in the holiday spirit because with SANS Institute, what I like to do at Black Hills Information Security is we are all about trying to share. We're trying to give back to the community as much as we possibly can because that's what we want to see in the community that we are all a part of. So let's go ahead and let's get started. I, I love these slides whenever we're talking about how organizations discovered that they were actually breached in the first place. A Verizon data breach report has been coming out for a large, uh, a long number of years, and they've been covering for the breaches that they work and other organizations that are contributing to these reports, how organizations discovered that they were actually compromised. And one of the big concerns about this particular slide is the vast majority of the DTECs, something like 67% of organizations discovering that they were breached, uh, they find out from external third parties. They would find out from external customers, actor disclosure, um, external audit service, or working an incident, finding another incident. And this really shows that what we're dealing with in computer security, at least as it stands today, is a fundamental gap in the skills that are actually required. And in many situations, the proper toolkits to be able to detect the attacks that are hitting our organizations. And that's why things like KringleCon and the hard work that Ed Scotus and the team at CounterHack does is so important for giving back to the community and you know, really giving people an opportunity to dig in, develop skills, and do it in a safe and fun and free manner. So if we're trying to discover how we're breached, we've got to find some new ways that we can discover breaches in our organization. Hence why threat hunting is so incredibly important. So whenever you're looking at a hunt team, an actual hunt team is actively looking for advanced attackers. You, you probably have been compromised in some fashion or another. It could be something as complicated as a nation state attacker breaking into your organization. It could be something as basic as ransomware that's dormant or crypto mining uh, that could be running in your organization. It could be any number of these different ranges of things in organizations. And honestly, if you're looking at a lot of the attacks that have hit the news lately, it's very clear that if security penetration testers and professionals have the ability to bypass IDS, IPS, and antivirus, then a lot of the attackers have those skills as well. So we need to be able to look at analysis from a number of different data sources. And specifically, I'm gonna be talking about network connections. We're gonna be looking at how we can look at network level data to develop better ways of trying to identify non-human beaconing behavior. So it's just one small slice of the pie on how we need to improve as a number of organizations, but at least something interesting and it's free. So the tool that I wanted to share with everybody is actually a tool that's very near and dear to my heart. It's called RITA, Real Intelligence Threat Analytics. And what it does is it identifies patterns within network traffic. And specifically, it's looking for beaconing traffic, long connections, weird DNS anomalies, and all of it's for free. You can download it at this GitHub repository. It's relatively straightforward and easy to install on a number of different computer systems, different operating systems that are Linux-based operating systems. But personally, I prefer to run it on an Ubuntu 16.04 system. We also have some instructions for getting it up and running on Security Onion as well, but you're gonna have to change the output format of Bro. Once again, all those instructions are actually there and easy to follow as well. But it ingests that Bro Zeek data. So if you're already running Bro Zeek in your environment, great. Rita's gonna be able to eat that alive and kick out all kinds of beaconing analytics for you. If you're not running Bro Zeek, you really should. Um, the level of visibility it gets in your environment is second to none. It's absolutely amazing. So check it out. So let's talk about how this thing actually works. So if we're trying to identify beaconing behavior, there's a number of ways that we can do this. We're gonna talk about three different ways that we can identify beaconing behavior in organizations. The first one that we're going to talk about is interval. Whenever you're talking about an interval, you're talking about a heartbeat. So a heartbeat 
can be slow. A heartbeat can also be much faster. So you can have a number of different heartbeats, but the point is it's usually fairly consistent. Erratic heartbeats usually are a good indication that you're having a heart attack and you need to get to a hospital as quickly as possible. So whenever we're looking at interval, the more consistent that interval is, the closer it is to a value of one. And whenever we're doing that analytics, if you have a, a beacon that's absolutely consistent, be it fast or very, very, very slow, the more consistent it is, the closer it is to an overall value of one or a hundred or a perfect beacon. And as you can see here, I have a number of different scattered connections and I'm just showing a cloud. If you notice the cloud's not 100% like right on the money, that's because anytime you're looking at network connections, you're always gonna have some level of data jitter. Uh, just because of network jitter latency that's put into the network, you're always gonna have a slight variation. So we can use algorithms like k-means clustering to actually look for the consistencies in these patterns in these data connections. We actually use a cousin to k-means clustering in Rita called MADMOM, Medium Average Distribution of the Mean. What it does is it looks for consistency in that interval, data size, connection time, and then it clusters, identifies the clustered pattern, sees how tight-knit that pattern is and how close it is to a value of one, and then it lets you know that that interval is consistent. We can also look at data size. Many backdoors will send command and control back to a C2 server and it'll say, is there any commands for me? No. Are there any commands for me? No. Are there any commands for me? No. An analogy I like to use when we're talking about data size and interval is children. If you're ever around a family that has small children or if you have small, ch small children, I'm sure that you have had a conversation with a child that goes, mom, 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 or dad, 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 dad. That's a beacon. And it's really, really, really consistent in its interval. And it's also consistent in its data size. And command and control backdoors, many of them behave very similar. They'll set up a connection interval and they'll beacon at that very regular interval, with very similar data sizes. And this is wonderful because we don't actually have to look at the payload. We can just look at the interval connection times and of course that data size. We can also look at the connection time. How long is a connection established for? Is it established for just like half a second and then it disconnects and it's very, very short connections or they're very long connection times as well. In fact, Rita has another module that exists called long cons, which basically adds up the total amount of time two systems have been communicating regardless of interval and basically stitches that all together. So think of it like this. Imagine you have a piece of spaghetti, all right? And that piece of spaghetti represents a 24 hour period. And the attacker wants to bypass beaconing detection. So one of the things they can do is they can randomize those connection intervals. That's the equivalent of taking the spaghetti string and breaking it into a bunch of pieces. Now, unless you're obsessive compulsive and you have serious OCD problems, those chunks of the spaghetti, they're not going to be the same size. They're gonna have bigger pieces, smaller pieces, little itty bitty tiny pieces. But if you take all of those pieces and add them together, it actually adds up to a full string of spaghetti. We can look at those connection times throughout the course of the day, and we can make a determination how long those systems are communicating regardless of the interval. Also talking about randomization, it's very common for adversaries to randomize or introduce jitter into their connection profiles, which is great for bypassing a lot of different tools, but Rita also has the ability to look at the dispersion of the connections. So if you have an interval that's 10 seconds plus or minus two seconds, you're gonna see all the connections between eight and 12 seconds, and you're gonna see 50% from eight to 10 and 50% from 10 to 12. So Rita does all this and it does all this for free. So be sure to check it out. It's a very cool tool that you can run. So what are you gonna find if you actually go about doing this? Well, to be honest, many of the compromises to your organization aren't actually compromises behind a threat assessment or a threat actor. Let, let me explain the difference. So if you have a compromise in a hole of a ship, that can be a hole, right? You have a hole in it, all of a sudden water's coming in. That's a compromise. Now, there's no direct threat actor around that compromise. It's just a hole in the ship. In many organizations, they'll have compromises in the integrity of their perimeter in ways they're not really aware of. For example, Team Bureau was compromised back in 2016. And this attack allowed adversaries to go through Team Viewer and then access the organization's networks through that connection profile. Or we have Gillette Wyoming. Gillette Wyoming had their hospital compromised and they believe it was compromised 
through an open RDP session or Nuance was compromised, very similar to Dragon Naturally Speaking. In fact, Nuance bought them. And attackers were going through this remote access and gaining access to hospitals. So you're seeing this integrity compromise in organizations that's through third-party software. It can be TeamViewer, it can be GoToMeeting, it can be LogMeIn, it could be RDP, it could be a beacon that's coming out for remote access. I have this wonderful land turtle that I have in the lower left-hand corner we have seen in hospitals where they have USB to ethernet adapters that you can remotely access just like a land turtle from a vendor portal. Once again, that's a degradation of the integrity of a company without a threat actor behind it. But odds are, given enough time, threat actors will actually come through those back doors. So tools like Rita allow you to identify these different rogue IT access points into your environment and try to neutralize them before they create massive breaches in your organization as well. So in addition to detecting malware, we can find these two, these things as well. And as I said, Rita is free. So let's kind of shift gears a little bit. We talked about threat hunting and using tools like Rita to do network analytics. I now want to talk about cyber attribution and cyber deception, something that's very near and dear to my heart. Before we talk about this section, I think it's important to ask a basic question what did you think IT security was going to be like when you started in this career field? Uh, did you think that you were going to be defending the internet and your network with a Nintendo power glove like Hacker Man? Or did you think the attackers would pop up a big green letter screen that said, you've been hacked? Or maybe, maybe you thought you would try to stop a hacker who's trying to hack your firewall using JavaScript with a younger, attractive member of the opposite sex. It, either way, a lot of us have been disappointed pointed by what actually happened in computer security. We kind of moved away from the active components. We moved away from actively checking IDS logs or dealing with some alerts. And we started spending a lot of time basically babysitting automated tools. And if we tie it back to the second slide of the presentation, many of those tools, when you look at the Verizon Data Breach Report, aren't working all that well. They have a successful detection of less than 1%. Well, maybe there's some other things that we could do. Maybe there's some other approaches. And if we're looking at Rita and network threat hunting, that kind of is a different approach, right? So we should start looking at those things. Some of the other things that we can look at is cyber deception. Another way to look at cyber deception is detection time plus reaction time must be less than the amount of time it takes for an attacker to successfully break into an organization. That's kind of the mathematical formula. Or another way to put it is all warfare is based on deception. So why isn't, when we're trying to develop defensive architectures for our organizations, if we don't use a little bit of deception to kind of shake things up a little bit for the attackers coming against our networks? So I wanted to share with you some geolocation uh, software that we've been working on. And in fact, we just update this. One of our uh, interns, Bradley, just update this, updated this at Black Hat. And uh, we've got this release, it's awesome. But it really goes back uh, quite a bit. We've been using this tool. Uh, this tool is called Honey Badger. And if you Google Honey Badger, it'll take you to Tim Tomes' website. Eventually, you'll find Bradley's website as well. And this particular tool has the ability to geolocate an adversary that uses or interacts with an element. It could be an executable. Say that you put up an executable and you have it, uh, say, this is a VPN config executable. If an attacker runs it, bang. Um, you can also have it run DB scripts. So you can put it in Word documents and Excel spreadsheets. And anytime an adversary opens those different Word documents and Excel spreadsheets as part of exfiltration, it triggers that macro and then it does full geolocation on the adversary. And it does this using a wireless site survey, finding all the wireless access points that are nearby. And then it uploads that to Google's API for geolocation. And Google will tell you where you're at in some situations with an accuracy of 20 meters. So we have Honey Badger. Oh, this is somebody we found in Moscow years ago with Tim Tones. We try not to talk too much about that because it tends to get a little bit too close to politics. So let's get right on through that. Um, this was actually a, an attacker on Pepperdine University. Put it right on top of his dorm room with an accuracy of 106 meters. So that was pretty neat. Now, the trick to getting an adversary to run these is making sure that you create bait that is believable right? Could it be an SSL VPN? Could it be that VPN executable? Could it be um, a, uh, a document or an Excel spreadsheet or something that you put out there that the attacker wants to run? They want to execute these things. A VNC, if you actually do some research and you look online, 
there's hundreds and hundreds of VNC servers that are exposed to the open internet. You can actually backdoor the Java version of VNC so that if an attacker downloads it and runs it, it actually will do geolocation as well. So there's a number of cool things that we've been doing at Black Hills Information Security that have been very effective to give location on adversaries. And you can play with them too, because they're actually free. So I wanted to tell a little bit of a story um, for our fine friends here at KringleCon. Uh, years ago, we had a, a contract that we were working and uh, this uh, big scary bank, uh, they wanted us to come out um, in Europe and they wanted us, we had a couple of customers in Germany over the years. And some of those people are still friends and they'd be contracting with us and that's great. But this one bank, they wanted us to come out and they uh, wanted us to set up cyber deception across the bank. We spent about a week and a half there setting it up. And I remember the CISO of this bank, or at least this branch of the bank was like, there's no way, there's no way an adversary is going to run any of these cyber attribution technologies that you're going to be putting in place. Well, some other fun things about this contract. One was they wanted us to be out over Thanksgiving. In fact, we got on an airplane about, I would say, seven years ago, and exactly seven years ago, because it was right before Thanksgiving, we flew out there. And the only reason why we took the contract was because uh, when they set up the contract, they gave them a, a price that was a lot of money because it was over Thanksgiving and I didn't want to go away from my family. And they came back and they're like, great, that's a good deal. And they offered to pay me in euros, which at the time was 150% of a US dollar. So my wife was initially very angry about this. She was not happy about us uh, getting on an airplane over Thanksgiving. And then she saw the contract and she like walked away. And I'm like, where are you going? She's like, to pack. So off we go to, uh, to Germany and the family. So we get into Germany. And uh, one of the first things that was kind of weird is uh, my wife actually set up the hotel for us in Germany. And uh, she found this hotel that was a great hotel. The cost was right. It was about a mile from the site, but I can walk that. It was no big deal. It was in the summertime. It was uh, not summertime. It was, uh, it was not cold, I guess I should say. So we land, we get out, and we're going to this hotel. And I'm using my phone, GPS, walking around trying to find this hotel. And the GPS has us go down the street that all the lights are like red and pink all the way down the street. And I'm like, ah, that can't be the street. It's in the red light district. So I kind of turn around and try to get my bearing and redo the GPS. And it's like, no, that's the street. So it turns out our, our hotel was in the red light district. And it turns out it wasn't a hotel. It was an hotel because the H was burnt out on the hotel sign. And it was one of those high class establishments that you had to go up and push a button to buzz in because they had this gate. And uh, we went up and buzzed and they catered to Americans. They're like, eh. What do you want? We're like, oh, let us in. And they uh, let us in and we get upstairs and immediately the lady at the front desk is like, oh my God, you have children. And we're like, that's an awkward thing to say. And she was all excited and she started making dinner for our family and she yells at her husband. And she's like, oh, we got to put new carpet in their hotel room. And we're like, this is just getting stranger and stranger. And sure enough, the husband comes out with a big roll of carpet, heads up the stairs. We're like, this is bizarre. And she makes a wonderful dinner for my family and I. And uh, finally, the rooms are done. We have two rooms with a door between them. And uh, we're snuggling in for the night. And we're terrified, right? So we're in Germany. We're in a red light district. And it's a very, we're clearly in a hotel that does not cater to families normally. And it's just kind of one of those moments where you're laying with your significant other. And you're like, what the hell are we going to do? This is horrible. And all of a sudden, the, the guy owner of the hotel like busts in, just kind of comes in because he has keys to everything. He comes in, he comes right up next to me while I'm in bed and goes, don't turn on the televisions. And he runs into both the rooms and unplugs the TVs and then like leaves right away. Well, it turns out that the televisions, um, every single station had a different type of porn. That was the type of place that we were staying in. And for the rest of the time, like our kids are constantly trying to like plug the TVs back in, figure out, you know, what's on and, oh, we want to watch SpongeBob. And I'm like, no, you don't want to watch that at all. And it, like I said, every morning we would get up and there'd be like, like, like these people on the streets that would like look at me and be like, honey, you looking for a good time? And my kids would be like, yes, we do. Yes, we do. And we're like, no, quick to the trains. Um, so it's just this absolutely insane 
sort of engagement that I was on because we're dealing with this and eventually it was all cool. The kids got to know some of the people that were walking around the streets and get to the subway, we could get wherever we wanted, but I had to work. So we set up cyber deception and cyber attribution on the edge of this network in a number of different files, a number of different formats, a number of different ways. And after two weeks, we had this. We had 275 hits where attackers all over the world were actively trying to pull down any information, any file, anything they could get their hands on. And we were able to locate them. Now, what's tough about this, especially if you're a very large bank and you're attacked a lot, is where do you even begin, right? So what they did is they took all of these ASNs that all of these IP addresses were associated with. And then they did a lookup on how many of their systems were making connections to these ASNs. And they found four computers that were compromised and were calling back to these various networks. Now that's threat intelligence, not threat intelligence about what happened in somebody else's network a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, but what's happening in your organization right now. And this type of intelligence, this type of work with tools like Rita, tools like Honey Badger, tools like ADHD, Tools like this, what many of us thought defense was going to be like. Many of us thought computer security was going to be like. The tools exist. The techniques exist. We can actually start doing some of these things. So one of the things I would also like to do with KringleCon is I'd like to spend a couple of moments and talk about prayer. Because there's absolutely no way that anybody at all really likes this topic. Right, because you know, as soon as you mention prayer, you have people that uh, are non-religious that are like, "Crap, uh, we're gonna have to shove down the throat." Or you have religious people like, "Is he gonna say the right prayer?" And and it kind of kicks up the pucker factor in a lot of ways. And at Sands, they're always telling you never tell jokes about politics, never tell jokes or anything associated with religion. And um, one of the things I would like to do is I think I think that there's a prayer that I think everyone can get behind, and this comes from somebody by the name of A. P. Delchi. And he had this prayer, God grant me the serenity to accept the people that will not secure their networks, the courage to face them when they blame me for their problems and the wisdom to go out drinking afterwards. And I think, I think that's something we can all get behind regardless of any affiliations whatsoever. So with that, I wanna say thank you very much to the CounterHack team. Say thank you very much to the Sands Institute. KringleCon is something very, very, very special. Uh, being the first fellow and making fellow with KringleCon um, is actually, I have that plaque around here somewhere. Oh, uh, I have it around here. I, I just got to figure out we're resetting the offices, but it's something that means a lot to me. Um, Ed Scotus means a lot to me. The counterhack team means a lot to me. And I know that I'm not the only one. So with that, let's hope we have a peaceful, quiet, non-catastrophic Christmas season at KringleCon and at counterhack challenges. Thank you so much.